Morning, everyone. Hey, good to see you. Very warm welcome to St Andrews. And um, yeah, it's great to be together again, isn't it? Over the last couple of weeks, we've been thinking about common struggles that we all have. And we started a couple of weeks ago thinking about anxiety. And then last week, we uh, talked about escapism. Well, today, we're thinking about anger. It's another common struggle, isn't it? Us human beings are emotional beings. God has made us with emotions. We relate to one another emotionally, sometimes with good emotions like love or compassion, and sometimes with bad emotions, resentment, jealousy, hatred, anger. If um, love is the warm jacuzzi of human relationships, then anger is the nine millimeter Uzi, okay? If love is the warm jacuzzi, then anger is the nine millimeter Uzi. And uh, of course, a nine millimeter Uzi is not necessarily a bad thing. It depends who's got it and what they're planning to do with it. Anger is a bit like that, isn't it? It's not necessarily a bad thing. Jesus got angry. God the Father is angry at sin, and rightly so, but our anger is often a bad thing. It's a bit like how a 9mm Uzi is often used in a bad way. I think it is the preferred choice of weapon of the Italian mafia. We'll see later that anger is spiritually very dangerous. So it is good for us to address it and to talk about it and to think about it personally. It's something that I've had to do. And not just in a theoretical way, because I'm a church pastor, I need to know what the Bible says about these kinds of things. Now I've had to think about it because I personally have an issue with anger. It's a personal struggle. I'm often quick to anger. And it's usually not good, good anger. And so in recent years, I've had to sort of bring that into the light and ask God to deal with me mercifully and to forgive me and to graciously change me. It is an ongoing struggle and battle. But it's because of the gospel of God's grace that it's okay to talk about all these common struggles and to not have to hide them away and struggle privately. God knows everything there is to know about us and yet still he loves us. And through his word and through his people as we talk to one another and by his Holy Spirit he is helping us to change. So as we begin why don't I lead us in a prayer and ask for God's help this morning. Almighty God, thank you that you are here with us and for the joy and privilege of meeting together in your name and as your children. Thank you that you do know everything about us and yet still you are willing for us to come to you and you love us. We pray that you would help each one of us to sing your praise and to pray to you today and we pray that as we consider what your word has to say about anger, that you would be merciful and gracious, helping us to see the truth about ourselves and then to be changed so that we may live as the people you would have us to be. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to join together now in the words of thanksgiving that are coming up on the screen. Now these are words that help us to remember many of the wonderful blessings that God has given to us, but which we often take for granted. So I'm going to say the words in light type. And if you'd like to, join with me with the words in bold. So we thank God for all his gifts to us, for birth and life and strength, for safety and shelter and food. We thank you, God, and praise your holy name for the beauty and provision of your world. We thank you, God, and praise your holy name for families and friendship, for work and leisure and the joy of achieving. We thank you, God, and praise your holy name. But above all, for the gift of Jesus, for the forgiveness of sins and the sure hope of heaven. We thank you, God, and praise your holy name. We shall not forget that you are our God and we are your people. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing our first song now. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, one of our favourites, I think it's been uh, over the years. Bless the Lord, O my soul, 
as we uh, sing. It's time to sing your, your, your song again, to sing God's praise again. That's what we want to do this morning as we meet together. So let's stand to sing, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. rich in love and you're slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I'll worship your holy name And on that day When my strength is failing The end draws near and my time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then forevermore Bless the Lord, O oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I'll worship Your holy name They say that uh, love is blind. You're so taken with someone that you can't see the dangers or problems that there would be if you were to continue in a relationship with them. Anger is also blind. When you feel angry, you can't see the problem with it. We very quickly and easily justify it. We all have a sort of an inner lawyer who tells us that our reaction to that situation or to what that person said was exactly right. We may not think that anger is that serious, but the Bible regards it very seriously. According to Galatians chapter 5, it is part of an ugly and dangerous mob. So verse, I hope there's a verse coming up anyway. Let's see. There's a verse in Galatians 5 that says this. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, 
It's another way of talking about anger, isn't it? Selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So anger, which includes fits of rage, is very serious. It is spiritually dangerous. It's one of the many things that will stop people from inheriting the kingdom of God. But there is an opportunity now for us to confess our sins. Maybe it is anger for you. Or one of, or many of the other things in that list. Perhaps jealousy or selfish ambition or sexual immorality or drunkenness. Whatever it is for you, why not bring it to the Lord now in the words of confession that are coming up on the screen. I'll read this uh, verse from uh, Exodus 34 first. God said to Moses, I am the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, full of love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. So let us confess our sins to our compassionate and forgiving God. We say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have not loved you as we should or one another as ourselves. We have chosen our own way and ignored you. But merciful and gracious God, the Saviour of all who trust you, please forgive us and make us more like Jesus. For his sake, turn our hearts to love all that is good and true so that we may live to please you. And we ask all these things for your honour and glory. Amen. We know that God is able and willing to forgive us because Jesus died for us. On the cross, Jesus uh, took the anger of God at our sin, the righteous anger of God, upon himself and deflected it away from us. And we're going to remind ourselves of that and the other truths of our faith in the words of the creed which are coming up now. Why don't we stand to encourage one another with these core truths of our faith. So we say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the rule of Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He was cut off from God. On the third day he rose again. He returned to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Christian church worldwide, the local fellowship of believers, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body to eternal life. Amen. Well, please do have a seat now, and uh, Daniel is going to lead us in our prayers, and it's coming up on the screen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are immeasurably gracious and kind to us, your children. You never cease to be generous and patient with us as we struggle with sin and get things wrong. Through the death of your son, Jesus, you committed yourself to always be on our side and to work things out for our good. You promised to use everything that happens to us, your children, to make us more and more like Jesus. Lord, as we look at real life heroes in the news, on the internet, on TV and social media, or also just made up heroes on film and television, We can either be inspired to want to be like them or can be crushed by realising that we never really will be. Lord, whenever this does happen, we ask that you point us to Jesus, who's the real life hero that we can depend upon and that you've promised promised to make us like. We can have hope because you've given us your Holy Spirit that gives us real hope that we can change. Lord, we can aspire to be like Jesus because when you look at us, that's who you see. In Christ, you've granted every one of your children with the incredible, amazing superpower of being able to love you and love others selflessly and sacrificially. And that is incredible, Lord. We thank you for your grace in giving us that gift. Father, we also thank you for this series where you're demonstrating in your love for us 
by dealing with our problems. Lord, you care about the struggles that we face and want, us to, want to help us overcome them. We ask, Lord, that you'd help us to listen well this morning, to think through what you're saying to us, to deal honestly and openly with ourselves and each other, and to come out the other side more like Jesus. As you do this, we also ask that you'd send us out to serve others in helping them deal with their problems. May we point them to Jesus because we know that only he has the power and the solution to heal them. Help us to speak about the grace that he continually shows us as we share our lives with our family, friends, neighbours and colleagues at work. We ask that you'd have mercy on them so that they can also have their problems solved and they can also experience this life-giving power for themselves. Lord, at the same time, I want to confess to you, our Heavenly Father, that we're tired and weary. We keep thinking that the restrictions and all the pain around COVID-19 is coming to an end. And even the government even has even said so much that, that, is, that it should be finished by now. But yeah, it still seems to go on and on and on. There still is uncertainty about what the future lies, what lies ahead in the future. Lord, we all long for life to return to normal and for us to be able to be with others without worrying about the consequences of just giving a hug to someone or sharing a meal. Lord, help and guide all the wisdom and decisions made by the countless numbers of people all over the country and all over the world about how to return to living a life of freedom to what we consider to be normal. Help all the people in government, but also on councils, in schools, offices, shops, hospitals, doctor surgeries, care homes and so many other places to make wise decisions that will help community to come back together. And Lord, we ask, also ask that you would help anyone that consider a risk to interact with others, who consider themselves or members of their family to be vulnerable to contracting COVID-19. Grant them mercy to do what they can, but more importantly, grant them mercy to entrust themselves to your tender care. And finally, Father, with all this in mind, we ask that you guide the PCC as they meet a week tomorrow to make wise decisions that will help us as a community come back together. Lord, give each member insight into the challenges and problems that we face, but also wisdom to decide what's right, how best to do it. And we also ask that you grant every member of our church the faith to believe that you're guiding us through this trying time and that you are using it to make us like Jesus. You are making us into the collective body of Christ. Father, in your mercy and in Jesus' name, we say it together, Amen. Just got a couple of notices uh, before we have our Bible reading. So as uh, Daniel's just prayed, there's the PCC meeting um, on a week tomorrow, Monday 27th at 7.30pm in here. Um, and then can I just, um, just draw your attention again to the email that you hopefully received midweek. Please do, uh, it was, it was a, an email about uh, as things open up again, um, we need to start cleaning the church again. And uh, so please do consider if that is a way you could serve. It's not a job for one person on their own. I envisage a group of people who will either all turn up together each week or be on a rotor. Uh, two or three one week and a different two or three people another week the following week um, that's something an important area of service that, so that we can uh, so we've got you know pleasant premises to come into for the youth clubs and uh, for us on Sunday and for whatever else might go on in here so uh, do consider that if, if you would um, well let's take up our Bibles now and if you've got a Bible with you and uh, you'd like to follow, it's in, uh, we're in Esther, chapter 1. So you might need to use the contents page at the front of your Bible to find where Esther is. Esther, chapter 1. And uh, Johnny's going to come. Morning, everyone. I thought I'd just say something before I read the Bible today. And as we're going through a series on common struggles, I think there's a little bit of a danger as we listen to sermons like this. So we've looked at anxiety last week, escapism, and today anger. 
I think one of the dangers that we face when listening to sermons is we listen to the sermon through other person or hoping that someone else will be hearing what is said. That makes sense? So if you're, if you're married or if you're a parent or a child even or you're in a home group or you're in a close relationship with someone in the church, you're thinking, oh, well, I hope they're listening up right now. And uh, the danger of that is that we, we miss ourselves. And the way that we want to listen to sermons is actually, Lord, would you speak to me? Speak to everybody individually, but may it not be down to me to be elbowing them in the middle of the sermon. Listen up to this bit, or peering over at different points when something's said. Uh, there's a helpful place for speaking with one another about our struggles, and, and you can pray for that, for, for, for that to be happening. But let me just read some words from Jesus that I think will be helpful as we think about this. Jesus says, this will probably be familiar with this, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? So we want to be thinking about the planks in our own eye and not thinking about that speck in another's as we come to God's word now and as we listen to it in a moment. With that in mind, Esther chapter 1. I'm also going to read a little bit of chapter 3 as well. So if you found it, is it going to be on the screen? I was quite late in the day. Can it? Oh, brilliant. Thank you very much, Holly. It's also on the screen if you haven't got a Bible. Esther chapter 1. Here we go. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes are ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. The military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. For a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. The garden had hangings of white and blue linen, fastened with cords of white linen and purple material to silver rings on marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other, and the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink in his own way, for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was high in spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, Mahuman, Biztha, Habona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zethar and Carcass to bring before him Queen Vashti wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. Since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the times and were closest to the king. Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Merez, Marcina, and Memucan, the seven nobles of Persia and Media who had special access to the king and were highest in the kingdom. According to law, what must be done to Queen Vashti, he asked. She has not obeyed the command of King Xerxes that the eunuchs have taken to her. Then Memucan replied in the presence of the king and the nobles, Queen Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but also against all the nobles and the peoples of all the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, and so they will despise their husbands and say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the Persian and Median women of the nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti, 
is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also, let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Then when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. The king and his nobles were pleased with this advice, so the king did as Memucan proposed. He sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, to each province in its own script, and to each people in its own language, proclaiming in each people's tongue that every man should be ruler over his own household. Then moving to chapter 3, I'm just going to read verse 1 to 6 of chapter 3 as well. After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore, they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated, for he had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet, having learned that Mor who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we're going to return to those verses in a moment. Before we do, we're going to sing together, Who Are We? Let's stand and sing. Who are we? But sinners saved by grace Guilty of the charge But acquitted in the case How can the most holy God Allow us to walk free? Jesus paid in full for All our sin at Calvary Who are we? Damaged by our past Grown to fall But Christ will hold us fast Trusting God while living with The consequence of sin Joyful in our weakness When our eyes are fixed on Him Praise our mighty Savior's name he left his throne on high and came And while we were still sinners He died to set us free Hallelujah, Jesus Christ be praised Who are we but pilgrims passing through? Life is like a mist, and eternity's in view. Rivers of self-righteousness, the foolishness of pride. We will boast in nothing but Christ Jesus crucified. Praise our mighty Savior's name. He left his throne. Still sinners, he died to set us free. Hallelujah, Jesus Christ be praised. Now we sing, united in the fight, justified by faith and righteous in God's sight. Let this local church display this truth for all to see That we were once condemned but now in Jesus Christ we're free Praise our mighty Savior's name He left His throne on high and came And while we were still 
still sinners, He died to set us free. Hallelujah, Jesus Christ be praised. Let me pray for us. Father, as we think about anger this morning, please would you grant us humble and soft hearts. Challenge us, we pray. And we ask that in your kindness and grace, you may use this time to help us understand ourselves better. And also that we might see again how the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news as we seek to change. Amen. Now, to start, I want to read you a chapter of a book. Yes, indeed, a whole chapter. I'm going to read you a whole chapter. It's from this book. It's called Good and Angry, Redeeming Anger, Irritation, Complaining, and Bitterness. It's a Christian book, and I'm going to read a whole chapter. I'm going to show you what the title of the chapter is. There you go. There's chapter two. I'm going to read the whole of chapter two. The title is, Do You Have a Serious Problem with Anger? Now, I'm going to read the chapter. Yes. Let me say it again, just in case you didn't get it. Yes. And that's the end of the chapter. He then moves on to making it your own. He starts to ask some questions. That is the whole chapter. If you don't believe me, if you can't see it, I'm going to put it on the screen. There it is. Do you have a serious problem with anger? Yes. End of the chapter. I wonder how you react to that. Maybe you're even angry hearing it. Do you have a serious problem with anger? Yes. Yes, you do. And so do I. And if you look back through your week, I imagine you won't have to look far before we start seeing some examples. When you were driving, maybe. In your parenting. When we were in pain. When we were watching the match. When we were playing a video game. Or we were asked to stop playing a video game. Maybe when we were on the phone at the doctor's. Or when we weren't listened to or didn't feel listened to. When something or someone was late. Or early. When it wasn't what you asked for or what you ordered. When someone was in your way. Or when you read the news. We might not think of ourselves as angry people, but every single one of us is. And so this morning... We're going to think about anger, We're going to, the sermon's going to be in two parts. The first part of the sermon is going to be understanding our anger, understanding our anger. And then the second part of the sermon is going to be about God's anger and God's power to help us to change. So first, understanding our anger. For help in understanding our anger, we're going to look at the passages that I read from Esther, The book of Esther retells a story of a great rescue by God for his people through the woman that the book is named after, Esther. The world superpower at the time when Esther uh, was alive is the Persian Empire. And it's the king of that empire, Xerxes, who is our focus first. So, chapter 1. King Xerxes has been spending the last 180 days, half a year displaying his wealth and the splendor of his glory, verse 4. And after those six months, he hosts a seven-day party. Now, this party is like a Hollywood after-party. It's uh, the red carpet, and it's like it's being held at the White House. You have the great and the good there, the VIPs of the kingdom. Marble pillars draped in linen, sofas of gold and silver, a pavement of the most expensive stones, unlimited royal wine served in goblets of gold. And at the same time as the king's hosting his party in the garden, the queen is hosting hers in the palace. Seven days in and the king is pretty merry and he orders for his servants to go and fetch his queen so he can show her off. However, verse 12, have a look with me. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. King Xerxes' anger at the queen's refusal to come is hot anger. 
hot anger. I mean, the text literally says he burned with anger. It would have been visible. You know, the atmosphere at the party would have changed. People's laughter and conversation as they sipped their wine would have stopped as they suddenly heard the shouts and the stomping of the king. We often use similar phrases to describe someone when they're visibly angry, don't we? Hot-headed. He's seen the red mist. She exploded. They're a bit hot under the collar. They're all hot and bothered. Or an argument becomes heated. I wonder if your anger expresses itself like this, in this kind of hot way. It's instinctive, it's reactive. It can feel like you go from naught to 60 pretty quickly. Maybe you're even known in your home for outbursts of anger and it's seen in shouting or physical symptoms, maybe of shaking or going red and can even lead to physical acts, throwing, stomping, door slamming, punching walls, or maybe even physical violence. Hot anger. But there's another type of anger in Esther. It's Haman's cold anger that we see in chapter 3. So in between chapter 1 and chapter 3, in chapter 2, King Xerxes basically hosts a Miss World competition to see who's going to replace the banished Queen Vashti. And in the sovereignty of God, a Jewish woman named Esther, with the help of Mordecai, who's her cousin, is made the queen. And we pick up the story in chapter 3 with Haman, the king's top official. And we read in verse 2 that all the other royal officials kneel down in honor of Haman. Well, Mordecai, a God-worshipping Jew, doesn't do it. And have a look at how Haman reacts in verse 5. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. He was enraged. He was angry. Now what we might expect to see next is something like, and he had Mordecai arrested, beaten, and imprisoned. He was enraged. But look at verse 6. Yet, is how it starts. Yet. So even that word indicates something different than we might expect is about to happen. Verse 6 says, Yet, having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. So his anger isn't hot and rash and impulsive. It's more cold. It's calculated. And actually, a lot worse, right? What we read there. Not only does he want revenge on Mordecai, but Mordecai's entire race. The Jews. And as you read through Esther, you see how his anger builds and bubbles. How it stews and it sizzles. I wonder if your anger expresses itself like this. You're not so much a ranter and a raver, but when you're angry, you go quiet. You sulk and stew and give the silent treatment. Things fester, playing them over and over in your mind or your heart. Revenge is on your mind, but you'll bide your time. People won't even necessarily know that you're angry with them. And if I'm honest, this is more the kind of anger that I see in myself. But whether our anger is hot or cold, or somewhere in between, or a bit of both, probably, for most of us, both have serious consequences on other people and us. See, the effects of Xerxes' hot anger... Or the Queen Vashti is never again to enter the king's presence. He's, and she's no longer the queen. More widely, there are consequences on women in each family as they are ordered to respect their husbands. Presumably in a way that is, do whatever they say. Just as the king wanted the queen to do. It's helpful to think through the consequences of our anger. 
What about hot anger? What are the consequences of that? Well, almost certainly damaged relationships, as our rage usually has a target in sight. A spouse, a child, a parent, a friend, a teacher, a colleague, a neighbor, a doctor, a receptionist, a call center employee, an opposition player, the list could go on. Or think of our anger at times at fellow drivers on the road, or the referee on the telly, or the politicians. The consequences of our anger against them might not be directly felt by them. They might not hear our rage in the car. But those in the car with us or next to us on the terraces or the sofa will see that anger. And if you're a parent, it'll often be uh, imitated by our children. Heat fills the room and the temperature is felt by other people. There are consequences for our anger. Long term, it may even lead to people being fearful around us. You ever heard that phrase, treading on eggshells? Not wanting to say something wrong in case they blow up again. Maybe you actually live with someone who struggles with hot anger and it's a frightening place to be. Hot anger has consequences. But so does cold anger. The consequences of Haman's cold anger is a plot not only to kill Mordecai, but all the Jews. Now, with the help of Queen Esther, that plot is foiled and actually backfires as he himself ends up suffering the fate that he wished for Mordecai, death. The consequences of our cold anger, like hot anger, is destructive to others. See, we often aren't as good at hiding our cold anger as we think. Others around us will pick up on our irritability or our silence and see how we're treating them differently or, how we've, or differently to how we've treated them in the past. But also the effects are damaging to self, like it was for Haman. It may feel good at times to stew on something, but long-term bitterness, grudge-holding, silent anger has a kind of self-destructiveness to it. Anger has consequences. Okay, where are we up to? Understanding our anger. We've seen the types of anger, hot and cold. We've seen the consequences of anger. But if we really want to know ourselves better, and ultimately if we want to see change, we need to go that little bit deeper. We need to see the heart of our anger. I use the word heart because it's the one that the Bible uses to summarize what's going on most deeply inside of us. The heart is our thinking. What we think about the world around us, about God and about ourselves. The heart is our affections, that is what we most love, what we desire. And the heart is also our actions. What we decide to do based on what we think about the world and ourselves and about what we want, what we desire. Thoughts, affections, actions. So let's look again at Xerxes and then Haman. Because we're given clues in the text to see what's going on in their hearts. To see why they respond the way that they do. And I hope that in understanding them, we'll understand our own hearts a little bit better too. So first, Xerxes. We need to remember what's going on. He's hosting, remember, a public party. A public party. And what's he seeking from that party? To display his wealth and his splendor. He is wanting others to admire him and be wowed at his power and his possessions. And his request for his queen is to display her beauty, verse 11. It's another part of his showing off. So when this request is refused, what's under threat for the king? Well, his power, his authority, and his control, she isn't doing what he asked. But the main thing seems to be his reputation. He's seeking to impress others. And the queen's refusal doesn't look very impressive, does it? In front of his guests. 
And he's shown to be weak and powerless in front of them. And that is not the kind of reputation that he wants. What about Haman? In chapter 3 verse 4, he is told by his officials that Mordecai doesn't bow before him. And then in verse 5, his rage is released because Mordecai would not kneel down to pay him what? Honor. So what's under threat for Haman? The repeated word seems to be honor. Mordecai did not bow down and he was enraged. He was not treated the way he wanted to be and the way he was expecting. His honor was threatened. What about us? What does our anger reveal about our hearts? Often lurking behind the frightening face of anger is fear. Something that we value is under threat and so we lash out in order to protect it. I wonder as you reflect on your anger whether you see fear. Maybe anger flares when your public reputation is under threat and there's a danger of humiliation. I can't believe they just told people that. Why did they post that picture? Or maybe anger flares when you're disrespected. The deeper issue here is often power and pride. How dare they? She spoke to me really funny there. Did you hear that? Can't believe it. Or maybe when your comfort is interrupted. Have you ever shouted, can't I just have a little peace and quiet? What's that saying about what your heart wants in that moment? Or when we feel like we're losing control, things are spiraling out into chaos, I'm struggling to cope, so we lash out. For those of us who are parents, that often shows itself in barked orders, threats, and the promise of punishment. I've got to wrestle back some control here. There are more potential heart issues, but we don't have time to think through them all. It's really important in battling anger to go deep enough to see our hearts. So we're going to do something a little bit different now. So far, I've been seeking to help us understand our anger. And now I want each of us to think about our anger. Think through a recent moment of anger. Okay? Preferably something really recent. Yesterday, the day before, the last week. And then I've got some questions for you to think about. First, what did your anger look like? What type was it? Hot or cold? Second, what were its consequences on self and others, would you say? And third, what was happening in your heart? What did you want or what was under threat? I'm going to be quiet for a minute while we think about this. Now I hope that we have all seen so far that the chapter of that book that I read earlier is correct. We do have an anger problem. But the gospel of Jesus Christ never just leaves us staring at our sin. It lifts our eyes to hope and help. And that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at now as we look at God's anger and God's power in our anger. So first, God's anger. The Bible speaks often about the anger of God or the wrath of God. So anger is not always wrong. Pete hinted at that earlier. There are times when we should get angry. So here are a few things to remember about God's anger. And each of them show us, I think, how God's anger is very different to ours. First thing to see, God's anger is always good. God's anger is always good. It's never bad. It's never unfair. It's never over the top. 
He always acts out of perfect knowledge of every situation. He knows all the facts. How many times have we reacted to something in anger and later regretted it when we hear a little bit more? God's anger is good. Second, God is angry at evil. Because his anger is good, it is directed at evil. People don't like the thought or the idea of an angry God, do they? But these same people would probably get angry when people that they care about are mistreated. And rightly so. God's anger is aimed at the target of evil. The horror of sin and its consequences in the world. His anger is good. And therefore he is angry at evil. Third, God is slow to anger. God is slow to anger. We read those words earlier, didn't we? Before we confessed our sin together. Exodus 34, 6. Slow to anger. Read the Old Testament and you will see that this is true. As his, as his people continue in their evil, he is slow to anger. He never flies off the handle. He is different to us. And then fourthly, it's vital for us to remember that God's anger is absorbed by Jesus. At the cross, the anger of God against the sin of his people was pointed at and poured out upon Jesus. Therefore, he is now no longer angry at those who trust in Christ's blood shed on the cross. This again shows the difference between our anger and God's. We want revenge and retribution, but he offers redemption and reconciliation. That's because the rest of Exodus 34, 6 that we read, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. God is truly, to use the title of that book, good and angry. His anger is different to ours and he can help us in our anger. He can help us. Now there's a lot of help out there for angry people. Anger management, for example, has some really helpful tips about thinking before you speak, exercising often, timeouts, practicing relaxation techniques, and so on. The problem with anger management, and indeed all forms of self-help, is that it relies upon who? The clue's in the title. Self. Self-help. The idea of self-help is that we have the resources inside of ourselves that we call upon in order to change. Now, anger management may help some change some of our reactions, but it, what it can't do is change our hearts. For that, we need God's power. We need God's power, we need his help. And thankfully, he gives us that in the person of his spirit who lives in us and feeds our heart with the word of God. And over time, as the spirit applies the word of God, what we think about the world and ourselves and God begins to change. Our thinking. What we most want and desire, our affections, begin to change. And therefore how we act. So change has to involve God's powerful word applied to our hearts by his Holy Spirit. Let me read some words that are helpful when thinking about our hearts and change. Colossians chapter 3 begins like this. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. These verses summarize the gospel for us. We've been raised to new life with Christ, for our old sinful selves died with him at the cross. He is now ruling and reigning at the right hand of God, 
waiting to return and to take us to be with him in eternal glory. And Paul says, set your hearts, set your minds upon things above. Gospel things. See, our hearts are always holding something tightly. We thought earlier about some of those things, didn't we? Our reputation, the power that we have, our comfort. And our hearts hold these things so tightly and naturally when they're under threat, we react. What Paul is urging us to do is to loosen that grip on those things. What he would call earthly things. And then to tighten our grip around something else. Things above. That they would become most precious and what we most want. I was just thinking this in the confession earlier. You know, what do we say towards the end of the prayer? Turn our hearts, Lord, to all that is good and true. As this happens, as, that, as my grip upon earthly things loosens and my grip upon the gospel tightens... It's God's reputation that I become more concerned with than my own. I delight that he is the God of all comfort and he promises peace and rest to his people. I rejoice that he is the one who is in control and not me. And instead of wanting power so others serve us, we start to use our power to bless and serve others. Just as his son Jesus Christ does for us. It's God's powerful gospel that we find in the pages of the Bible that changes our hearts, that loosens our grip upon earthly things and causes our hearts to grab more tightly things above, gospel things. And as this happens, there will be character change. There will be an outward difference. There will be fruit Christ-likeness. What might we expect to see? Oh, that we'd be a people who look more like this. We'll become more humble, less proud. When we're angry, we presume that we're right, don't we? Pete mentioned that earlier. It blinds us and it deafens us to other people's explanation. But the gospel grips our hearts. We'll grow in humility because we recognize, I, I'm not God. I'm not perfect in knowledge. So the, the change in action will be, will be slower to speak, quicker to listen to others and to our God. We'll become more gentle, less harsh, not so snappy, irritable, sarcastic, but seeking to be gentler and calmer, just like our Lord Jesus is with us. We'll become more patient, less reactive, not blowing a fuse whenever we're crossed or criticized, but patient, slower to anger like our Lord and self-controlled. We'll become more peaceful, less vengeful, like Christ on the cross who prayed for his enemies. Romans 12, 18 and 19 say, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it's mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. And then also, we'll become more angry about what God gets angry about. And less angry. And when we fail, which we will, this side of Jesus' return or our going to be with him, we will fail with anger. We'll be people who are quicker to run to Jesus in confession and repentance. The one who never failed the one who is truly good and angry all the time, the Lord Jesus. So much more to say, but not enough time. Let me finish. We have a serious problem with anger, but we have a powerful God who is at work within us. Let us set our hearts and minds on things above and watch God change us from the inside out. Let's pray.
Father, as we reflect upon our own anger, we see ugly expressions of it, whether hot or cold. We see the consequences of it upon others and indeed ourselves. And Lord, we ask that you would indeed show us the heart of it, that we might bring these earthly desires to you in, in confession and repent, Lord, so that our grip upon earthly things is loosened and our grip upon gospel things, things above is tightened so that our hearts would love and cherish these things more than anything else. Father, we ask for help. We need your help. We thank you that you send it in the person of your spirit and in your powerful word. Please, Lord, would you increasingly make us good and angry. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to sing the same song that we sung at the end last week. The song, uh, Flee from Sin and Run to Jesus, summarizes again what we need to do as we're confronted uh, again today with another area of life where we know that we fall short. But this song reminds us that there is great help available to us in the gospel of Christ. And so we're going to sing it together now. Let's sing, uh, Flee from Sin and Run to Jesus. Thanks, Holly. Sinner 
promise of 